Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to my third lecture in this series. Um, and today, my topic is um, cosmic archaeology. And what this means, basically, is um, looking for fossils and for relics of the past in the sky um, that tell us about events that happened um, a long time ago um, that you know, we cannot actually see today um, occurring, or perhaps we can see other things occurring, but we're looking now not directly at these things, but at their memories, as it were. And so let me um, begin with um, one of the most interesting questions um, that was raised a long time ago, um, known as Olber's paradox, although it was discovered by, um, or discussed by people long before Olber's, most no notably Thomas Diggs, in the 16th century. Um, and um, Olbers was a German amateur astronomer who rediscovered this uh, a century or two later. So the idea is, you know, why is the night sky so dark? I mean, I'm sure you've all been somewhere other than London where you can actually see the night sky and get some feeling for, you know, especially in the desert or somewhere on a mountaintop where um, there, there's no pollution by city lighting, um, how amazing it is. Um, and um, most poetically, this was described by um, Edgar Allan Poe, actually. So, and he said, were the succession of stars endless, this is from a prose poem called Eureka, uh, then the background of the sky would present us a uniform luminosity like that displayed by the galaxy, that means the Milky Way, since there could be absolutely no point in all that background at which would not exist a star. The only mode, therefore, in which such a state of affairs we could comprehend the voids which our telescopes find in neutral directions would be by supposing the distance of the visible background so immense that no ray from it has yet been able to reach us at all. Um, so that was his explanation, which doesn't quite make sense. But anyway, um, um, uh, because everywhere you look, there are stars. So here's an example of Olber's paradox. So imagine looking further and further, deep into the universe. You see more and more stars. Everywhere you look, there's a star, no matter how far away. So the whole sky should be as bright as you know, this nearest star. Um, well, it isn't. Obviously, it isn't. Um, this is what the night sky actually looks like, as seen. Um, this is one of the deepest images yet taken of the night sky um, by the Hubble um, telescope, space telescope. And you can see there's lots of space in between all these galaxies, right? These are distant galaxies, billions of light years away, and in between, it's all very dark, right? On the average, it's quite dark. Everywhere you look, you're not running into stars, obviously, only in you know, some tiny fraction of the direction, so you run into something that shines. Okay, uh, but does that really make sense? Um, so here's another view. You may say, well, maybe it's all hidden by dust. Well, dust you know, does radiate in the infrared. So here's an infrared view of the, of the night sky taken by um, a, a, a special survey telescope. And again, everywhere you look in the infrared, um, you know, mostly it's dark. I mean, you see a little more glowing because there's dust, diffuse dust emitting in the Milky Way. But, you know, mostly it's dark. Okay, so the question then is, why is the sky dark at night? Okay. And um, so here is the essence of the paradox. Imagine dividing the universe up into shells of um, stars, galaxies, or whatever. And then clearly, as you go further away, the shells have got a larger area. But also, the light from the stars in the shells decreases. And it so happens that the increasing area and the decrease exactly counterbalance each other. Because the shell goes up as the square of the distance, that's the area, and the light falls off as the, the famous inverse square law. So they exactly cancel. So every shell of stars counts. And if the universe were infinite, you'd have an infinite brightness in the sky. Or if it were finite, you'd still have an awful lot of brightness in the sky. So what is going wrong? Um, uh, this is the paradox that Poe and Olbers and Diggs and others talked about. So um, there is no limit, especially if the universe is very large, as we think it probably is. So here's the resolution. The universe has a finite age. The stars have not been shining forever. Um, and in fact, I'll show you in a minute where this age comes from. It happens to be about 13.7 billion years. And that, in fact, means you're limited in the number of stars out there that can dominate the night sky. 
So that essentially is why the youth of the universe, relatively speaking, the sky is dark. And this, this is an idea that we've only been able to quantify in the past few decades, in the, in the 20th century, basically. Um, yet it was uh, apparent in the 16th century there was a problem there. And so it's an interesting mixture of... Um, thinking about the night sky and resolved by, by, you know, our discovering that stars really have a certain age. Um, okay. So that's an example of looking at the past and deducing something. But now let me turn to um, more specific examples of fossils, of doing archaeology. And so the first one I want to show you um, is very fundamental. And so this is to do with the origin of the forces of nature. So today, we live in a universe where, you know, um, human beings can, um, uh, you know, uh, we're not subject to strong nuclear forces. We're not, we not, don't annihilate with other anti-people, that sort of thing, you know. But once, long ago in the past, there were equal amounts of matter and antimatter, uh, long ago. And that all, because that's the symmetry of what we think fundamental physics teaches us, and that, but that symmetry was broken at some point, and we're left with this asymmetric universe where all the anti-people have long since annihilated. And, you know, we, that is, ordinary matter is what we're made of. Not anti, you know, for every proton, there's an anti-proton, opposite charge, and it would annihilate if it came together. Um, we know that happens. We study that. We can create these things in the laboratory. But basically, the universe we see is full of matter, not anti-matter. But long ago, it was different. And so here is what things were a long time ago. Um, and so this is... Um, the evolution of the universe from a state of really high energy to the present day. And just to give you some feeling for these enormous numbers, if I go to um, the Large Hadron Collider, this particle accelerator in Switzerland, I can basically probe to higher energies roughly over here. But theory tells us that there were incredibly high energies in the past, but at the very beginning, um, we don't really have a, an explanation or a theory of basically time zero, because this is the mixture of gravity and the quantum theory that we're lacking. So this is where it's a bit of an unknown. But ever since then, um, things were unified. All the forces were the same. Then as things cooled down, as one proceeded towards the present time, still a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, the nuclear forces separated from the ordinary forces that hold our atoms together, control the chemistry that surrounds us and you know, explains all we see. And, and this release of energy when the force is separated. It's a bit like um, in, a, in, in a frozen lake. You know, um, there is latent heat being released as because of the formation of ice. And this means the water is slightly warmer than ice. There is liquid water in a, in a frozen lake. And fish can live. And this is an example of extra energy release when you change in state from frozen water to liquid water. And in some way, you're changing in state also from this incredibly high energy universe to something made of the ordinary forces. And so this is sort of the unification of forces, branching off nuclear from the forces that control our chemistry. And, and this change in energy gave rise to inflation, the size of the universe being so big, as big as it is now, and all that stuff, which I talked about in my first lecture. Okay, so, but today I want to focus on how do we know this? What is the relic? What is there from the beginning, okay, that tells us that this history may have, you know, some elements of truth in it. So um, what I want to discuss first, then, are the relics from the first fraction of a second. Actually, um, this is 10 to the minus 36th of a second, but that's when the inflation occurred, this great expansion because of this energy release that led to the size of the universe, the universe being as big as it is today. So why are we so confident that um, this is what happened? Well, the fossil that's left behind from this early, really hot phase of the universe, there's a fossil radiation field, and we call that the cosmic microwave background because it goes so, it, its wavelengths got so highly stretched, it was expanded, that we now see it in microwaves, radio waves, but at the beginning, it was incredibly hot. Of course, we're not there, but we infer that was the case because we've measured the expansion of the universe. So what does this fossil radiation look like? Well, this is what it looks like. Um, um, so this is the sky, um, and this is what we call the cosmic microwave background. And remember, um, in my first lecture, I told you how it represents its distribution of frequencies in this radiation, its microwave radiation, but... It's like a perfect black body. It's, it can only have been formed in a furnace, and that furnace was the first, the first weeks, the first months of the, of the Big Bang, okay, the beginning of the universe. However, so in some sense, when we look at this, and you can actually, if you turn your 
TV, on to in-between channels, you see noise on the TV. 1% of that noise is this microwave radiation that surrounds from the Big Bang. So basically, you're looking at the first, basically, weeks of the universe. But it's actually more powerful than that, because when we began looking at this radiation much more precisely, we, this was what was discovered, that at the level of a few parts in a million, there are tiny fluctuations. So in this picture, I've subtracted away this uniform field, okay? And we're looking for the tiny, tiny differences in temperature from spot to spot on the sky, okay? And these are um, on the order of a few parts in a million, and these are, there are slightly um, warmer regions, slightly colder regions. And these represent the fossil fluctuations from which um, all the galaxies uh, that we see today, everything formed the ripples in space and time that create, led to structure as things, the denser bits got denser as time went on and formed the galaxies and all that stuff. Okay, so that's, that's, that, that's, this is the key to almost all we know about the very, very early stage of the universe. But what is sort of amazing about this picture is that to understand the origin of these fluctuations, um, you have to go back to a time which is very close to this, you know, beginning of the universe at a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. Because only then, during this inflation stage, when the quantum theory was very important, could these fluctuations have been created. There simply hasn't been time to make them ever since. And so this basically is a glimpse. The, the fact that these fluctuations exist is essentially proof that we have a theory of the universe which takes us back to this tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang. Okay, so this is... Um, this is a relic of the universe, right, of the beginning of the universe. We, 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 we look back in time, when we look far away, we see these fluctuations. Okay, um, let me um, now turn to another um, uh, important part of this, this story, and that is, why are we so confident that we know the age of the universe? How much time has elapsed since the beginning, the quote beginning, okay, we can get very close to it. Um, it is tens of billions of years. Why are we so certain? Well, this is why. Um, um, we can measure the expansion of the universe. And these are three different histories of the expansion. Here we are today. We're measuring the universe expanding. That's what th this, th either, either of these lines mean. So there's a universe which will keep on expanding, expanding forever and ever as time goes on, getting bigger and bigger. There's a universe over here which is just going to make it if it keeps on expanding. And there's one which I haven't drawn, which will collapse in the future and come down like this, to another future, future Big Bang, okay, or future crunch point, it's called. And then there's another universe over here, which has, been which has begun to accelerate in the recent past, and, and is expanding more, more rapidly, okay, so it has a, it has a okay, and this, is, and this is probably, um, and because it's got a bit of acceleration, it began a little bit earlier than these other universes. Okay, so we believe from the data that we've measured this extra push in the expansion, this so-called acceleration, and this time we can measure from just from doing from measuring the data over here, basically near, near the present time, all the galaxies we can see. That's what this green circle represents symbolically, and that gives us a measure of the age. Because if things are expanding, then we know how long they've been going for, and that time is 13.7 billion years. Okay, so that's a time you get from looking in the sky. Okay, now you can also date the universe from something else, okay? And this is a time that you get from looking at the Earth, okay? And the amazing is you get the same age. So how, does, how do we measure such an old time scale on the Earth? The Earth is only, you know, um, 4.7 billion years old. That's the age of the um, inferred to be, you know, from the oldest meteorites, etc., the age of the solar system, and we infer that's the age of the Earth too. So the way you do this is you use radioactivity. So you look at uranium and its isotopes. It decays into lead, um, a lead isotope. And the half-life of uranium decay um, is very long. For this particular transition, it's 4 billion years. So if you can measure the isotopes in a sample of lead and uranium, then you can infer how much has decayed. It's really like a natural clock. You can tell whether, you know, if you're very old, it's all decayed. If you're very young, it's half decayed, etc. And so but from the ratios, and there are one or two other isotopes that come in the story too, but they're all naturally occurring isotopes, you can use natural radioactivity, okay? Not man-made, you know, there are other isotopes of uranium which are very useful, like uranium-235, which has a shorter lifetime and is, you know, used for other things. But this, this gives you another age, and from this you can also conclude by measuring 
different isotopes of lead, that the universe has an age of, again, very, very close, nearly 14 billion years, just from doing radioactive chemistry in the old rocks, oldest rocks on the Earth. Okay, um, so that's another example of using local fossils, rocks basically, to deduce the cosmic, cosmic age, which you also get independently from looking at the most distant galaxies in the universe. It's really an amazing coincidence, and because we get the same age from these two incredibly different approaches, we're convinced that the universe really is this old. And if anyone tells you the universe is 5,000 years old, you will say, well, you know, maybe it says so somewhere, but, but this is what we actually measure, and, uh, and uh, that should be the end of the debate. Okay. Um, right, so let's now talk about where these elements come from because that's another fossil. So the elements in the universe are also fossils from the beginning, because they tell us something about conditions when they were formed. So let me um, first show you the periodic table of all the elements, okay? Um, so these are all, all the elements known to man, from hydrogen, lithium, beryllium, up to, you know, um, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, and um, all, all, you know, etc. cetera, okay? Um, um, zirconium, radium, all sorts of things, okay? And you can see that a few of them, the ones in light blue, were, really came from the Big Bang. So you began with hydrogen. That was it at the, the beginning, so our theory tells us. But at the Big Bang, as I'll show you in a second, produces, is able to make, because it was so hot and so dense, the light elements, some of the light elements. It can make mostly helium and little bits of lithium and beryllium, but it doesn't make any more, okay, apart from a bit of boron. All the rest basically comes from stars, okay? Um, and there are a few things that are man-made, uh, very, very rare things, thanks to, you know, uh, nuclear explosions and high-energy collisions. People actually can create artificially very short-lived elements. So let's not talk about those, but that does expend, extend the periodic table. But you can see that stars account, look at all the green, I mean, these are exploding, and the, with a dollar sign, these are exploding stars called supernovae. They account for an awful lot of what's going on. Okay, so basically what this means is that we are made from a mixture of the Big Bang and the ashes of the stars because um, all of this plays a role in the synthesis of the elements. So let's begin with the Big Bang and the light elements. Um, so Gamow was the pioneer of, um, of this idea. He was the first one that took very seriously the notion that the universe was very hot at the beginning the Big Bang was very hot, and therefore was the dense, was the ideal environment to, for nuclear reactions to make elements. And with his student and his colleague, um, Herman and Alpha, they basically talked about, you know, the first half hour of the universe and argued that the, the elements were made. The light, and that they first thought they could make everything in the Big Bang, but they were wrong, and it turned out that, about that, and it turned out that, um, that, that they could make helium, lots of helium, okay, and a bit of deuterium, a bit of lithium, Okay, and these more or less all have the, have the right value that we observe today. And so because these elements agree with the observed number, okay, and they, they all these curves cross at some point, we think they must have the right answer. This has, there's no other way to make these elements. Uh, there's far too much helium in the universe, in the sun, to be made in, in stars. It must have made very early. Likewise, deuterium is only destroyed when, you know, in, in the, at the present day by stars. And the fact that we measure some in the older stars tells us also it's a cosmic thing, lithium too. So th this is sort of proof that everything was made in the first half hour, the first few minutes of the universe. Okay, um, so the light elements are part of the story, okay? But they couldn't make carbon in the Big Bang, which is critical to life because there simply um, wasn't, uh, wasn't time enough to build up. And so a more stable environment was needed, um, and this environment were, was that of stars, exploding stars, stars that were, lived and died very rapidly. And we see around us regions where stars are being born and dying. It, it's no mystery. We study this in astronomy with our telescopes. And so in some sense, the elements that we have in our bodies are really... The, just the ashes from, from dead stars. Um, so how does this work? Well, a star that's, um, say, 10 or 20 times the mass of the sun starts off being hydrogen with a bit of helium, um, but mostly it, in the center's mostly hydrogen to start with. Helium's just a, you know, a, a minor, a fairly minor component. And the, and the star gets so hot that it undergoes 
thermonuclear reactions in the middle, just as in the hydrogen bomb, which is an uncontrolled version of, of thermonuclear reactions. But stars, it's more controlled because there's enough mass around it to stop stuff squirting out at first anyway. And so the hydrogen burns into helium, and that releases energy and keeps up the star, stops it from collapsing. But then at some point, you run out of helium, okay? And that's, that's, uh, that's bad news um, because you have no more fuel. It's just as though, you know, the fossil fuel on the Earth is exhausted. But the sun can then collapse a bit and heat up, and then you can burn the helium at a higher temperature. It's more massive, more protons. It's harder to, harder to burn, high, higher charged nuclei to carbon. And then eventually, you work your way down to iron. And iron is the ultimate slag heap of the universe. There is no more energy to be extracted. And so when you finally burnt the core to iron, the whole thing must explode. It collapses and explodes. Okay, the center collapses, releases so much energy, so it ejects the outer parts. Okay, and these outer parts then circulate around the galaxy. And the person who, the people who discovered this, um, um, a pair of um, UK astronomers who moved to the States, um, the Burbages, um, Fred Hoyle, and Willie Fowler, um, an American uh, a nuclear physicist. Um, and um, he was a great fan of um, um, trains, toy trains, and they gave him this, I think, for one of his birthdays, and, um, and as fate has it, it was only Fowler that got the Nobel Prize for this discovery um, because these other three, one, one thinks these other three ended up doing far more un un unconventional things in cosmology. I mean, um, and so, uh, anyway, Fowler was given officially... Uh, the credit for the uh, discovery, but all, all the four of them played a major role. Okay, so here is an exploding star. Um, this star exploded in 1054. Um, the Chinese astronomers, or astrologers they probably were at the time, recorded this, okay? As something that briefly lasted a few months and then disappeared from the sky in the constellation of Taurus. Um, Okay, so, and we've now, with the Hubble Space Telescope, revisited that spot in the sky, and we find this amazing exploding nebula. We can measure its speed. It's moving out from a point in the center um, where that explosion occurred in 1054. It all matches up. So we, we, see, we see that explosion. And in this, this nebulosity consists of the debris from the exploding star, highly enriched in, in these extra elements like carbon, etc. that eventually will be the seeds of life. And just to show you how that works, here's the future of that. This is a different... The beauty of astronomy is you can look around the galaxy and you see different stages of evolution. So the future of this is um, here. This is uh, in, in, in the constellation of Cygnus. It's another star that exploded millions of years ago, in this case. And so you can see the debris from this explosion dispersing out and mixing in with the interstellar clouds. And it's from, um, from that stuff that eventually all... Um, our solar system will eventually form. So here's a cartoon showing you how this works. Um, so this debris um, circulates. There are, this is the disk. This is the Milky Way with explosions occurring symbolically. Um, gas is being thrown out, and it circulates and comes back down, and all mixes up. And um, and um, this is basically a sketch of the Milky Way. You may say this is far-fetched nonsense, but look at this. This is an actual X-ray study of a nearby galaxy showing you exactly this working. Okay, so here are the stars. Here's the hot gas being thrown up, and and um, so things like this we can see this circulation process, this recycling of the debris from dying stars. Um, all of that, all of that is occurring before our very eyes. Okay, so that's sort of amazing that we can see all this stuff, and there are a number of objects like this. So that confirms the general story. Okay, um, so let's um, move on to um, the next uh, pit of debris on a larger scale that I want to tell you about. Let's move on from single stars. I want to take you on to entire galaxies. So um, galaxies um, are fragile things. When one galaxy approaches another, and they do, there are so many of them, they can actually be disrupted and um, leave debris trails behind. And so we can study these debris trails, which are stars or gas, and learn about what happened a long time ago when galaxies collided with each other. So we're now moving away from the stars. That's our Milky Way scales of thousands of light years to scales of maybe millions of light years, okay, the, the larger scale structure around us. So here's a, an example. This is a, a computer simulation of, um, of a small galaxy coming in into the Milky Way, and it's being pulled apart by what we call galactic tides. So because as this galaxy 
approaches our Milky Way, the inner part feels a stronger force than the outer part, and that stretches it out and eventually leaves behind this whole old stream of debris. Okay? And so this is a signature of the debris from nearby galaxies. Now, this is interesting because um, for the, um, the, the explosions of stars, clearly the carbon that we are made of, all this stuff, came from stars within a few hundred light years. You know, the, it took a certain time for the debris to circulate. But now we're looking on a scale that might be millions of light years, the entire region around the Milky Way. Small galaxies come in and they can spread their debris. So it's a whole different scale of phenomena, but the same sort of thing applies. This mixing from larger scales. So does this mixing actually occur? Well, this is, this is a computer simulation. So what I want to show you next is an image taken with a small telescope. This is a one-meter telescope taken actually by an amateur astronomer um, originally. Okay, and so um, he just looks with a very powerful CCD camera very deep with a small, a small telescope is useful because there's a large field of view. And around this apparently nor, near normal galaxy, okay, nearby galaxy, uh, which is overexposed in this picture, he picks up these really faint streams, okay? Um, and so these streams are due to, uh, again, a small companion falling in and being pulled apart as it goes around at least twice around this galaxy. And again, um, computer simulations um, show you a similar story. So here's an example of um, computer simulations, again, just trying to mimic this phenomenon. And again, you can produce these same patterns. So when you see patterns like this around galaxies, you know that they're fossils of something violent that happened a long time ago. In this case, um, uh, certainly, um, you know, hundreds of thousands, mil millions of years ago, probably a hundred million years ago even, because that's the time it takes, roughly speaking, one orbit, okay? So we're, we're really sampling the past, okay? Long before, say, the dinosaurs were formed, etc. In, in relative terms for the Milky Way, you, you know, for the, uh, the solar system, we can study what happened um, by studying the past. Okay, um, so this is a nearby galaxy, uh, a few, you know, million light years away, but let's ask the question now, what about our own Milky Way galaxy, right? What, what do we know about that? Well, um, this has been an amazing source of discovery over the past few years. Um, what we've discovered as we look really deep into the Milky Way has been something that's been called the field of streams, and these are streams of stars which have been pulled out by gravity effects from nearby galaxies that swing by the Milky Way. They just get ripped apart. Okay, and so, um, and so this is what was discovered. And so the way, and, and those colors represent um, um, different types of stars, basically, and different streams. Um, and and so you're supposed to look at this, and the reason they found this was this was done with something called the Sloan Sky Survey, which um, systematically obtained images and spectra of millions of stars, okay, funded, funded by the Sloan the Sloan Foundation over the past 20 years. And so they, they have this catalogue of millions of stars. And what um, this, this group at Cambridge initially did was they had a very clever way of um, selecting stars, just the bright stars, as, the, as they're essentially their they're, they're candles to, 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 to illuminate the, the sky around us. If, if I put in all the stars, it will be crowded. But they just look at the bright stars, they're called giant stars. And when they did that, they could suddenly see the, these features. Okay, And these features were all... Um, eventually got names, and so here are some of the names, and so there was a dwarf galaxy of which we still see the remnant in, in the, near Sagittarius, and, and so it's left these, um, it's been around the galaxy once and come back a time, another time, and so you see these, these trails, and these are other streams from dead galaxies, so they see at least one, two, three streams. In addition, they saw these incredible agglomerations of stars, so in this actually, these are galaxies, these are nothing like the standard beautiful galaxies that you see in, in, the, um, in the Hubble Atlas, in the various catalogues of, of, of galaxies that are taken with telescopes. These are called ultra-faint galaxies because they're the remnants, that just all that's left over from what might have been a huge population of, of small galaxies that once were part of our, part of our Milky Way. Um, and, and so... Uh, and, and, and we've been discovering more and more of these um, with our ultra-deep surveys. And so now let me um, say a little more about, about these ultra-deep ultra dwarfs. So, so here you see um, some, some examples. So those are the ones I just showed you. And as we, in, in, these are discoveries from just very recently, as people look deeper and deeper and count stars more carefully, 
um, that they're seeing um, just these tiny collections of stars around us, not very far away, really. This is 100,000, you know, uh, 100,000 light years away, rather close to us, relatively, within our own Milky Way confines. This is a, uh, you know, a tiny galaxy, the remnants of a tiny galaxy. Okay, so these remnants tell us that the Milky Way probably assembled out of some huge cloud of small galaxies um, that forms what we see as the Milky Way today. And then there was gas clouds that made more stars and all this. But that assembly process left over relics behind, fossils behind. And they are basically are in sort of a frozen state, as it were. They're left there out in more or less the middle of nowhere, way out in the halo around the galaxy. And they're going to stay there forever, right, these collections of stars. And so they, are, they testify to some violent process that happened in the inner parts of the Milky Way. They're the relics. Okay, um, so our galaxy formed out of many small galaxies, but we do have big galaxies not very far away. So about 2 million light years from the Milky Way is um, the Andromeda galaxy, and um, it's coming towards us. So someday in the future, there'll be a collision between two galaxies. Let me remind you, a galaxy is a collection of 100 billion stars. So these are massive systems, but of course they're all space. It's a bit like ghosts colliding, because a galaxy is you know, lots of stars, but there's all the spaces between the stars. And so, it's, so galaxies can collide and pass through each other, but in so doing, their gravity fields will tend to distort them. There, there'll be these tidal forces that pull them, tend to pull them apart. But if they're big galaxies, they won't get pulled apart. Okay, so let me then tell you about now how we look at big galaxies and um, look at possible collision. So first of all, let's begin with the computer. So um, this is a simulation, a numerical simulation on a big supercomputer, showing you what happens when two galaxies come together and they form this, this sort of mess of stars, okay? And they leave these, these long trails behind. These are called tidal tails, which are pulled out by gravity. Basically, as the, as the centers come together, they, the, the gravity fields stretch out these, uh, these regions behind them. Okay. Um, so that's the sort of thing we expect. Now let me take you to um, one of the most um, impressive telescopes that we've ever constructed in space, called the Hubble Space Telescope. I'm going to show you some images of collisions between galaxies. Okay, so does this really happen? So um, here's a, a beautiful example. Um, so these galaxies are at the same distance. You can see they're beginning to be affected by this encounter. Okay, um, and this this. Uh, and in the future, these two will spiral together and form um, a big mess like you saw in that simulation. Um, okay, so and we have a number of examples like this. Here's another one. Okay, so here's a, a galaxy actually in the process of merging with this galaxy. This is a beautiful space telescope image. These, these are regions of star formation. And this coming together of the galaxies is believed to enhance, to create lots more stars. This is the region between them that's being compressed by the effects of gravity and being drawn out as this thing approaches and, and orbits around the galaxy um, and eventually falls into the bigger one. Okay, getting a bit closer. Here's another example um, where the two galaxies of, you know, not such dissimilar size are in the process of coming together. Um, and uh, so these are beautiful phenomena that we see in the sky, and it's quite likely that's the future of our Milky Way, because Andromeda's going to come towards us in a, you know, it's a long way off, but that'll happen in some, you know, tens of millions of years or whatever, hundreds of, hundreds of millions of years, I should say, in the distant future. But nevertheless, that, that, that may await us, but, but it's interesting to stare around our neighboring galaxies and see examples of, of the future, as it were. Okay, um, and here maybe is the most dramatic case. Um, so th this is, these are called the antennae, these galaxies. That's uh, just a nickname being given by astronomers, and these really are very actively coming together. And this process of merging is compressing the gas clouds and making lots and lots of stars. So th this is a, a gigantic collision. Uh, imagine, you know, cars colliding on your motorway, right? That's on scales of miles. Now we're looking at, you know, millions of light years, right? But, or uh, several hundred thousand light years, at least from here to here. And, um, and we see collisions, uh, destructive collisions, but also creative collisions, because you're not, for the small things, you were destroying them. But in this case, probably you're actually bringing the clouds together and making lots and lots more stars. So this is a, this is a creative process, too, in the cosmic scheme of things. That's what makes it sort of exciting, because we think this is telling us about the past of galaxies. Okay, um, 
So here are some very typical galaxies, okay? Um, uh, so here is um, a galaxy which is full of old stars, okay? Um, um, this is, a, this is a, a bit like the Milky Way, but if you see it edge on, this would be full of forming stars, but with a very large old population of stars. And this is a galaxy, it's a neighboring galaxy, Andromeda, just like the Milky Way is thought to be, with again this population of very old stars in the center, more or less spherical, and all this stuff around it in the disk making lots of young stars. So galaxies form into, you know, fall into this category, we call these spirals, or this one elliptical. So those are the two, basically two types of galaxies. Okay, so the question is, when you look at these pictures, what can you learn about the past? Well, I'm going to show you some amazing clues, and I'm going to take the simplest of these images, because it gets complicated. If you start making lots of stars, as you do in here, in, the, in this disk, then you hide the traces from the past. It, you know, it's, it, it makes it hard to see. So we're going to begin by looking at this galaxy and, and similar ones to it, which look just perfectly normal, even boring galaxies, okay? And so how does this all work? Um, well, it's a bit like, um, you know, you've got a crime scene and um, you're going to try to analyze. Um, and so you have to look much more carefully, right? And so this is how, how it's done. Um, you, you go to your collection of these normal galaxies, elliptical galaxies. The nearest big one is in a cluster called Virgo, in the constellation of Virgo, where there are thousands of these galaxies. And then in this experiment, the astronomers went really ultra deep. They just put on this very sensitive camera and just went as deep as they possibly could before the, the night sky, you know, the glow from distant stars stopped, stopped them. And so in the centers of each of these pictures, you see what would have been, what, look, what are essentially normal galaxies. But when you go ultra deep, you start seeing these amazing things on the outskirts, right? Look at this, this thing here and, and all this debris. This does not show up on the images that you see in the Hubble Atlas, the standard images of galaxies, whatever. So th this is debris from the past. Th these are relics of some events, such as a merger between galaxies that happened, um, again, many hundreds of millions of years ago. Why, why do we know that time scale? Because we measure the speeds of these stars, and it takes of order 100 million years, basically, for, for an orbit or for things to merge together. So we are looking at things that happened a very long time ago. OK, and so that's the way that we basically um, uh, can use optical telescopes to, to, to probe the past. So there's another way to do this, um, which is um, actually takes us to an even bigger scale. So now I'm going to consider a, a whole cluster of galaxies, okay? So galaxies, um, many of them come in groups of thousands together, okay? And we think that on these scales of clusters of galaxies, even the clusters themselves merge together, because as, as time goes on, gravity pulls things together. And this is the amazing thing that we found in this case. So this particular example is called the sausage. And um, it's this green thing here. And um, what we have are two, these are special types of maps that tell you there are two centers of gravity, one here and one here. And these are two clusters of galaxies. Each one is a million, millions of light years across with thousands of galaxies in. And um, they're, they're merging together. And as part of that merger, there, there, were, there was a, you know, many sorts of um, uh, uh, remnants left behind when they first came together, and this is one of them, seen in radio waves. It's a, it's a gigantic shock that's, millions of, that's about two million light years across from end to end, and we think that was left behind when the clusters first merged, because the cluster is full of hot gas, and it's the gas that collides and then produces like a natural cosmic accelerator. I mean, the stars themselves pass through, each, pass through you know, they don't have to hit each other, but you, in the gas is what you can see. And it, so that's one nice example discovered in very deep imaging with... Um, um, a telescope called, um, which is based in Holland, but spread all over Europe, actually, called the Low Frequency Radio Array, um, and with the bran branches in England. And this is another example. This one is called the toothbrush. Again, um, look at the green, okay. Again, millions of light years across. This is a, these are two clusters of galaxies almost completely merged together. But this happened, you know, was left behind from the collision. Again, uh, in this case, probably a billion years ago. Okay, so we're looking now, we're sampling um, things that happened a long time ago. Okay, um, good, so it's probing the past. So let me now take you close to home, the Milky Way, okay? There's something very bizarre going on there too. There once was something quite amazing that occurred in the center. Let me show you that. This is a map taken in gamma rays. Gamma rays are interesting because they, they, they measure 
the collisions of cosmic rays with gas, and they also measure very, all these points are sources of gamma rays, and they're quasars, basically, very, very distant sources, okay, many, many of them, and the Milky Way is glowing as lots of these, lots of, you know, less bright sources in, in it, and that's what causes this red, this yellow and red emission. Okay, so if you look more carefully at this gamma ray map taken by one of the satellites orbiting the Earth now, and still taking data, you see a diffuse glow. And here is the diffuse glow in gamma rays from all over the sky. And so this is the Milky Way, okay? And these are, these are basically, these are slight artifacts of the projection, but so to ignore the, the, the weird shapes, but this is all diffuse glow. But in the center, this is the, the center of the Milky Way, Sagittarius is the, the continent where the center is, there are these two enormous bubbles in gamma rays, okay? And so this tells us that about a million years ago, there was a huge explosion at the center of the Milky Way. And all we see is the relic of that explosion now, shining in gamma rays, cosmic rays, etc. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a fossil. That's doing archaeology, something totally unexpected, again discovered a few years ago, um, telling us about the, our Milky Way, which has a big black hole in the middle, a few, weighing a few million solar masses. We know that because we measure the stars orbiting around it. But today it's very queer, so nothing much is happening there. Okay, we, we, know, we see the black hole from following star motions, which we've measured over the years going around the center. We know there's a black hole in the middle, but nothing much. But a million years ago, there was a big explosion, and the explosion occurred because stuff fell into the black hole. A cloud came by, fell on the black hole, and fueled it up and powered the explosion. Um, okay, so um, let me try to, um, to summarize for you. Um, um, we do cosmology um, basically um, by looking um, into uh, the remote past with big telescopes. We try to go as far back as we can in time. Um, and we also can do cosmology by looking for the fossils. Okay? And so uh, these fossils um, are relics of what happened in the past. Okay? And that past may mean you know, millions of years ago in the case of the bubbles in the center of the, the gamma rays in the Milky Way, hundreds of millions of years ago when I look at the relics of collisions between galaxies, and billions of years ago when I look at the toothbrush or the sausage, which are relics of mergers between entire classes of galaxies. So, um, uh, so looking at the past um, uh, is important because in some sense when you look far away in the universe, because things are so far away, the light signal you get is very weak. The advantage of looking nearby is the, a lot of photons, a lot of light lo locally, so you can look very deep for the relics of things that happened a long time ago. So the two things are complementary. Cosmologists do both. Um, uh, they look far away. And what, and what are we trying to do? So then let me um, conclude with the questions um, that we uh, would like to answer from looking into the deep universe. Basically, where do we come from? What, what, is, the, what, what is the past? You know? And that, that's where all this stuff, these relics of the past are telling us. We can learn about the origin of the elements, um, the origin of, of the stuff that we're made of, the origins of the galaxies, the origins of the stars. All these things are locked into nearby fossils. And we can begin to see um, some of this stuff with great difficulty when we look very far away. We're looking for signs of the first stars. They're very hard to see um, because, you know, stars are just not that bright. We can barely see galaxies very, very far away. So finding the first stars is really difficult, which is why if you look locally in the Milky Way, you have a chance. The reason is that the first stars we think had very, very little in the way of carbon or iron or anything. So what is a first star? We believe it's a primitive star made basically of hydrogen and helium. So we're looking very hard for these stars, and if you look at a million stars in the Milky Way, as the Sloan survey did, then you're going to find a handful of stars which are really, really deficient in iron. And so we found that handful. They have you know, one millionth of the... Of the um, of, 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 the, of the iron in, in, in the sun, for example, we think they're the first stars in the Milky Way, but they're not the first stars in the universe, okay? Even those, rare though they are and incredibly simple though they seem to be because they have so little way of heavy elements in their spectrum, um, but they're not the first stars because the elevated elements they do have must have come from some previous generation of stars. And so what we learn from this is the previous generation, the so-called the first stars, were stars that were very short-lived. They were massive stars that exploded, and it's their relics they leave behind in the most metal poor stars we see in the Milky Way. So, in other words, that's another example of a fossil. 
Everything you see in the most primitive stars must have come from long gone stars, but have left their imprints behind. As though you know, you have your di dinosaurs leave their footprints in, you know, in, in in relics of rocks, whatever. And so you can learn that they were present, and and e even without getting their actual, you know, bone structure, whatever, skeletons, relic bones. So it, that there are imprints, and the same is true for the stars. Okay, so, um, and then, what is the universe made of? Um, again, that's a major goal of, of, of all of this, to understand um, whether all the clues I've told you uh, will tell us the composition of the universe. I've talked about the carbon and the heavy elements, but there's other stuff there too, apart from the hydrogen, um, and that is um, stuff called dark matter, for example. That, that's far more abundant, maybe five times more than ordinary matter. And so we have to understand where did that come from? What role does that play? I mean, because there's so much more dark matter than ordinary matter, that controls the gravity of everything, you know, when things collapse. So it's a very important um, indicator of, of how formation occurred in the structures like the Milky Way. And then um, the final thing that we try to... Um, try to do is to decide um, where are we going, you know, the aim of cosmology is predicting the future of the universe, so for the sun we know, we know we're halfway along, right, the sun is about four, four or five, five billion years old, 4.7 billion years old, to be more precise, that's from dating meteorites, it's got, it's about halfway along, we're safe for another five billion years, but we know at that point the sun will run out, it will burn out, its hydrogen is playing the core, it will start burning helium, become so much hotter, the outer part swells up, It'll become a huge thing called a red giant star that will envelop the Earth and all life will be uh, incinerated if there's any life there in five billion years. Who knows? Anyway, um, so we're still searching for, um, for the future. Um, and on the larger scales of all, we know the universe is, is beginning to accelerate. Things are moving further and further away. Again, that tells us that the universe, instead of becoming larger and larger, the universe we see with telescopes is actually becoming smaller and smaller, which is a bit weird, but that's what we expect the future to be like. Okay, and of course, for all of these questions so far, I would say that um, um, it's fair to say that um, we're still searching. We really... Uh, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>